onto YouTube, which is brilliant. Um, awesome. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome to the next session of QGIS Open Day. Um, I'm um, super excited. Yeah. About um, oh, hi, Tim. <laughs> I'm super excited about the session. What we're going to be doing is reviewing these amazing two books behind me, um, which I was able to get at and around the Phosphor G conference. We have um, Hans von der Quast with us, with um, his room full of students. Hi, everyone. Um, and we also have um, Kurt with us. Um, and both of them are going to go over just a little bit about their books, about the second releases, what's new. Um, we also have Victoria and Tim in the room. Um, just generally as backup, <laughs> but um, they will also be asking questions. You will see I have posted the um, link to this meeting in the live chat. So if you'd like to join us live, please feel free to do so. Just make sure your mic is muted before you come into the room so that there's no feedback. Um, that is all of my introduction. I would like to then hand over to Kurt, who's going to show a slide. And um, Hans, take it away, just giving us a great introduction of you um where QGIS for hydrological applications has gone in the second edition and generally what's happening yes thanks amy and uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, have some time here in the QGIS open day to talk about uh, uh, one of the books from locate press QGIS for hydrological applications second edition and then later kurt will uh, talk about uh, his book uh, but we wrote this one together and uh, Found was time for an update because QGIS goes fast, and uh, it's really great that uh, uh, that we have so many new features that are also applicable for hydrological applications that we could integrate in the, in the book. That's both for analysis and for uh, styling uh, and, and map design. A lot of new uh, things compared to the first edition. For example. Um, we will have uh, the raster attribute tables introduced, which will uh, probably in the near future become even a core feature, but now it's a, it's a normal plugin, not even an experimental plugin, so you can uh, install it and uh, the book describes how to uh, use that to add attributes to your uh, raster maps. Um, another really uh, nice new thing also personally, uh, because I have developed uh, the PC Raster Tools uh, plugin, um, and uh, Niall Dawson made it, uh, finalized it nicely uh, together with me uh, to have it as an official plugin in the repository. And it adds uh, around 100 map algebra tools uh, to the processing toolbox of QGIS. Uh, but it also gives a lot of nice things for the future to even uh, put dynamic, uh, spatial dynamic models into QGIS. Um, Actually, that's what the students are learning uh, this week to uh, work uh, with uh, PC Raster in uh, Python, and they are today learning a bit of uh, PyQGIS. So uh, hope they can connect a little bit the dots with uh, what they did last week with the book because they have used the book in class. Um, another nice thing, as mentioned here on the slide, is uh, flow direction styling with arrows and 3D visualization. In the first edition of the book, we had used uh, this, the procedures from Saga. Uh, there have been some uh, issues with Saga for uh, hydrological applications. Um, uh, QGIS went to the uh, uh, newest version of Saga, and therefore some of the tools are uh, not usable anymore. Um, so that was also my reason to switch to PC Raster because it's more robust, and uh, I'm close to the developers of PC Raster at Utrecht University, the uh, chair group of computational hydrology, uh, computational geography in uh, uh, the Department of Physical Geography. And uh, it seems that uh, there's a great uptake of the plugin. I saw that there are more than 15,000 uh, downloads already. And uh, teaching with the plugin goes quite well. Installing uh, also uh, goes fine. So I really hope uh, more people try it out. And the book gives a great introduction to use uh, those tools for stream and catchment delineation. Then we have the pie charts uh, section in, uh, in chapter six, which has been updated to uh, use the colors of the layer in the legend. But uh, there's even a newer thing now. During the last contributor meeting, we, uh, together with uh, Matteo Guetta uh, from Data Plotly, who developed the Data Plotly plugin, um, it's much easier now. But you need QGIS 3.26 for that. Um, and there's a video on my YouTube channel that explains that new procedure. It's a, basically a one-line expression that you can use now. Uh, but the book is based on the long-term releases because many people will use this for operational uh, use and therefore I chose to stick to the uh, LTR version. Uh, but if you want to try new features, then uh, you, 
can always go to 326 uh, when you are, and um, also videos on my YouTube channel go beyond the, the LTR uh, sometimes. A uh, really cool feature uh, that made it into the book is uh, using and creating legend patch uh, shapes, um, which really makes uh, your map much nicer, also for uh, hydrology with uh, different styles for uh, rivers in your legends, and also you learn how to create a custom legend patch uh, for the catchment boundary. So you have a little uh, rural catchment boundary in your legend. Uh, that's really nice. Uh, the new uh, feature, which was introduced in 3.18, so not so new anymore, but it didn't make it into the, uh, to the first edition, is the elevation gradient. So you can have now uh, ramps uh, easily uh, added to your uh, map design, to your print layout. It was a feature that, uh, that I financed, so it's also great to see how many people uh, use that now day to day to have uh, the, uh, the ramps uh, added to their uh, map design. And a really nice cool feature which makes workflows much easier is using the dynamic text in the print layout where you can simply add uh, the current date without uh, writing uh, the expressions for that, for example. So uh, here's a link to, uh, to the book uh, on the Locate Press uh, website. And what's also important to mention is that uh, if you purchase the book, um, uh, part of the, the income goes to a fund to support IHC Delft students from the Global South, uh, preferably female, to join uh, POS4G and QDIS events. And we already have a few of those alumni. So uh, that's, I think, a nice uh, extra thing if you get the book. So, uh, yeah, feel free to ask Brilliant. questions. Thank you so much, Hans. Welcome. <laughs> that would be great. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions now for Hans specifically on QGIS for hydrological applications. I think let's pop through and do some questions now, and then we'll go over to Kurt's presentation. I, so, and I, have, okay. I have a little bit too. Just I would like to add that you know this is obviously a book on a specific workflow, um, hydrology and catchment delineation, but the book could also just serve just as well just to learn the basic workflows in QGIS. The workflows taught, some of the workflows taught in the book would apply to many different topic areas, so especially the symbology map creation, for example, and just the general use of things like the, the processing toolbox. So I think, and, and geo-referencing imagery and editing. So there's a lot of uh, tasks in this book that are generally applicable to almost um, everyone. So while it is topical, it's also just a very uh, fine book for learning how to work with QGIS. Thanks for oh, that. absolutely. I agree. Um, well, I think one of my favorite sections is this one. Um, <laughs> so it's preparing data um, from hard copy maps. And I think digitizing old maps is somewhere that is a something that people don't generally like doing, but also that especially newer users find difficult to wrap their heads around. And the thing with this book is it's running through with a consistent example of how to do it. So yes, it's hydrological, but that's the example of how to do it. Once you know those skills, you can really apply to absolutely everything. So um, as I said, Hans, I'm only halfway through, but I am really enjoying as I go through all of the really cool functionality and the ways that I can apply this my everyday work, even as a cartographer, which of course is my um, passion. Um, it's been really, really fantastic. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe the, I, yeah, go for it. Maybe you want to also hear some opinions from, uh, from the class here, because some people have followed uh, the course uh, by Kurt and myself. So Kurt was also in this Absolutely. hybrid setting here in the class and they've used the book. <laughs> so uh, I could give the word to, to someone to, to give an opinion. Um, let me switch Please to the do, absolutely. Here. So here you can see the class. And um, Elisa, maybe you want to tell yes. your experience with using the book last week. Please let me know if you can hear me. I think yes, absolutely, I can hear you. Last week we were working with this book. And at the same time, simultaneously, we had the online guide. But at some point, it's very comfortable to have your printed material and to follow as procedure and to check and to be able to uh, trust in something that you know it's, it's very carefully prepared. So it was really helpful at the beginning. I 
Shadow used the Epson 44 as it's always better to have a dual speaker guide. So that's what I appreciate more, I think, about people. The logic that is used to describe the procedure and how you can follow it and you uh, reach the same objective. It's not uh, hard. You just need to read carefully. But it's, it's a, a very, very easy to follow for someone also who has never been involved in this kind of problem. What's also nice is uh, uh, Elisa uh, and, and some others here followed the course, uh, and the course also has an online uh, environment with all kinds of uh, links to the videos or in, embedded in the online course. And uh, we also do a Kahoot quiz uh, every day on the theory to, uh, to see if it uh, made sense for participants. And uh, Elisa was the winner of the QGIS and mug because we always give some goodies. Every day they can win a sticker, but uh, Elisa <laughs> won the mug. She had I the also have my and she also had a new collection of stickers. It was quite obvious that she was going to win in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant stuff. Um, I quite yeah. appreciate the comment about you um, taking through, you know, the logic of the steps of doing things. I think often with QGIS, because there's so many options and ways of doing things and multiple tools to do things, it can be a little overwhelming. So I think it's great with a book like this that it actually takes you through the logic that's you know, simple, simple from someone who knows how it's done, um, from someone who's tested, tried and tested it. So I'm glad to hear that 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 logic is translating. And do you think, Alyssa, that that logic will help you in further projects using QGIS? Yeah, because some process or um, some um, uh, some guys are just logical for the one who is expert, but not for the other. I think in this case, they can transmit that. This is the simplest way, and this is a good way, and you can follow it, and it's so simple as, as it looks. Even when you have more options, this is better, and they explain why. Brilliant, brilliant. So it's a book for everyone, not just experts. I love it. <laughs> um, do you have any other comments from in the room, Hans? Yeah, we have this uh, nice participant from your country. Yes. Uh, Hi, yay! I'm from uh, from uh, Richard's Bay area. Nice meeting you. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> from, from my experience, I find a uh, well-written book. Uh, the steps are quite clear. And uh, as someone coming from a, a teaching background, I think it can be easily adopted to teach students how to do basic practices like uh, digitizing, and uh, I think that even simplified, as in some cases, even myself, I get challenged a bit when I'm just thinking. So I think it's, it's well written, and the steps, the, the, the styling, the styling has simplified a lot, and I think uh, they are well done too. And go for more improvements in the next version. Thank you. Brilliant stuff. I'm, I'm going to ask you, Hans, because there are a couple of questions in the live chat right now. So I'm just going to fire those off quickly to you. Um, the first one is from Fiesel Rehman. I'm sorry if I did not see your name correctly. Um, how do the recipes compare um, to that available in Arcturus? That's uh, an important question because uh, I think the... Um the workflow, so each chapter starts with the explanation of the, the use case, and we have also added flowcharts, and these are generic. So whatever software you want to use, or even within QGIS, which plugins you want to use to solve it, uh, is up to you, but the workflow remains the same. For example, stream and catchment delineation is quite a standardized uh, workflow. There are just some varieties that you can do. But uh, the first edition used exactly the same introduction of the chapter for Saga. And I could write also the chapter for white box tools. Uh, I would not write it for uh, ArcGIS for obvious reasons, but somebody could do that. Um, but that's uh, in fact for all these uh, uh, introduction uh, sections that explain the generic uh, case with the workflow. Um, so it's portable. It's just that we apply it with what we think is, uh, is optimal for this class and for this week. Awesome. Um, the next is from Antonio. Do you think it's more useful to have a printed or PDF copy? 
depends on your situation. So uh, I've been talking about this also with uh, Kurt during the course and with some others. Uh, didactically, so if you are alone uh, in your computer and you want to learn it by yourself, uh, I think uh, a printed book works uh, nicely. If you uh, have a small laptop screen, then you have uh, the book, printed book next to you and you will, you will read carefully and do the instructions on your, your small screen. That's the same in class, I think, if you work with laptops like people here in class. I'm not a big fan of that. I like computer rooms with two double screens and also for my home office. If you're in that setting where you have uh, big screens, yeah, then uh, a soft copy uh, well, is much faster to get it to your home and you can have it on one, one screen and on the other screen you run uh, uh, the tool, you run QGIS. So I think it depends a bit on your situation uh, what's best, but I think if you have a small screen, a printed book really beats uh, an ebook. Absolutely. And then the last um, live chat question is again from Faisal. Um, does the book explain the maths behind the workflows? Um, partly. So we can't go into too much detail about the hydrology because it's still to learn uh, GIS. Uh, but there are references to, to theory. There's a lot of uh, theory in the um, uh, the playlists on YouTube. So each chapter has on my YouTube channel a playlist and it starts with a theoretical video. So if you want to know more about the theory of stream and catchment delineation, then uh, that is uh, explained uh, software agnostic. So based on the equations and the concepts, and then you apply it in the book with uh, QGIS. Awesome. That is all the stuff from the live chat. <laughs> Great. Is there anybody here in the room who wants to comment something? Yes, please, go ahead. Another participant from last week. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ramon Kualiswas. I'm from Bangladesh. And uh, in this short course, basically, uh, we uh, read this book and uh, 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 that book is really uh, helpful because uh, I am from the very beginning, uh, especially this uh, GIS application. And uh, I used in Bangladesh, basically, we used GIS. Uh, ArcGIS, that is the paid version. But here, uh, I don't stress that QGIS, this is uh, really, some people say, okay, this is the uh, free version you can download. Uh, but uh, I think this is really uh, accumulated in the books and uh, book uh, on all the applications uh, with digital version, like uh, in the intro game, there is uh, so uh, we can go through the YouTube directly, uh, with our, um, we can um, step, we can follow the steps uh, one by one. So this, I think, um, this book, in, in, in fact, a book that is a table of content, what we should write, what we should, should learn, and step by step, that's a good instruction, what we are going to feel and learn. So I think this book is uh, well written, and um, I really, uh, because as a beginner, I think uh, this is uh, good for me, uh, so I have taken this book. And um, I think uh, another my opinion is, uh, if there are any um, different language version, like, uh, uh, like other languages may uh, now uh, I am for English. I don't know how there is any plan for the future. Uh, and um, I think uh, this is uh, somewhat from my side. I think this is good for the beginner also. And, uh, or, um, and of course, uh, those who are uh, in advanced level, I think this is also good. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I go into that uh, comment on the language. Um, so uh, for the books uh, so far with the publisher, we, uh, we publish only in uh, English. Um, although I see on Twitter often questions about language. But what we have done for the first edition is uh, release uh, the uh, online course, so the one that you followed, uh, in different languages. We have many translators, uh, volunteers who have translated it. So the first edition materials are at GISopencourseware.org, available in uh, Spanish and Portuguese and some other languages probably. Um, so, yeah, I think we can just uh, continue in that way also with the new edition. Um, but for books, I'm not sure. That depends on the, on the opinion of the publisher, if that's a viable option or not. I think it would be amazing for accessibility, but perhaps, you know, it's difficult practical, you know, in terms of being practical on how many languages I'm sure most of my South African friends out there know that we have 11 official languages. So it is quite challenging to, you know, get the book translated into so many different languages. But I do think it is really important for accessibility and for everyone to be able to understand. So, 
yeah, if you're going out and um, translating books and translating documentations, get in touch with Hans. I can say that uh, I'm working with, uh, we're planning with a Spanish colleague to translate Discover QGIS, the second edition, into Spanish, because there's certainly a large population of Spanish-speaking QGIS users out there. And um, so the, uh, the publisher is open to having books translated, I think, if there's generally a big enough market share for that language to make it worth the time and effort. I think we should move on, Kurt, to your um, presentation, if it is 20 or so minutes. Yes. Um, go on to that. And then at the end, we'll have another question and answer general discussion session. So over to you, Kurt. OK, great. So I have uh, a presentation here on uh, the other book we're talking about today, Discover QGIS 3X, the second edition. So this book um, is quite a bit bigger. It's almost 400 pages long. It was just published in, in August. And so I want to go through a little bit of the history of this book and what's included and what's new. So there is a, a web page with Locate Press for this book as well. Um, locate Press slash book slash DQ32. Um, and price is always um, of interest. The PDF is $35. The print edition is $69. Um, but I want to go through a little bit of the history of this because it's, it's kind of interesting for um, nerds, I suppose. So if I we go back to 2013, 2014, um, there was this thing called the Geo Academy. And this book, Discover QGIS, has its foundation in the Geo Academy. So this was an open curriculum developed by me and another colleague under the leadership of Phil Davis in the US. And so we, we built this in 2013, and then we had it tested in 2014 amongst 5,000 students. And it used to be available as an open courseware online. I, I believe it's all been taken down at this point with websites um, gone missing, but it, it included these five courses that you see on the slide. Those five courses were built against this thing called the geospatial technology competence model. So this was something developed by the US Department of Labor. It's a hierarchical model of the skills, knowledge and abilities needed to be a geospatial professional in today's marketplace. So these KSAs, as they were called, were vetted by something like 40 or 50 US GIS educators at the time. And so the Geo Academy on the previous slide was an attempt to build this model curriculum in Phosphor G software, which we did. So if I go back to the, the history of this whole series of books, this this book was published in 2016 just the, the original discover QGIS, and this was um, basically my way at the time of updating that geo academy to the latest version of QGIS, which was what two 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 some two eight or something at the time i forget um at any way um in 2019 then um when QGIS 3.0 was released I again updated the book. This version of the book, though, the first edition, was probably 25% different than, than the original book. I replaced two sections uh, that basically consisted of things that I found are valuable as, as a, my, in my business as a GIS consultant and my experience in teaching. So I, I kind of updated the book to make it a little more um, representative of all the workflows that you can do in QGIS in this version that came out in 2019. And then this year, just last month, uh, the second edition of this book came out. And this second edition, again, is probably 25 to 30% different than the first edition. And I'm going to go through now what those differences are. You can see the page count is you know roughly similar between all three books in the series. But they all have their their roots in that Geo Academy curriculum. So it's nice because this is you know the still the first three parts of the second edition are material that's been vetted on how to teach GIS to um, to people who are wanting to make a career out of it. 
So the book itself has five parts. So the first part, Introduction to Geospatial Technology, is where I introduce um, data models and file formats and generally the QGIS interface and how to start bringing in data from different sources and working with it. The second section is where we go into spatial analysis and how to do different workflows, both in vector or raster formats to produce models of, um, of uh, site selection models and things like that. Um, the third section on data acquisition and management covers things like fe now field data collection, working with Postgres databases, working with metadata and all those uh, data management activities you have to do as a GIS specialist. The fourth part covers cartographic design. So how to set up a basic print composition and then even how to work with things like the style manager in QGIS, set up labels, uh, build atlases, work with um, print templates and things like that. And then the last section is advanced data visualization that gives me room to go into a lot of the amazing tools that QGIS has, like geometry generators, the 3D environment, the temporal controller, and now point clouds. So the first three sections here are still updates from that original Geo Academy, and the last two are, are, are new. Um, the book itself includes data files for each exercise and then solution files as well. So if you want to open up the solution to an exercise or specific tasks within an exercise, you can do that. So some stats, the book is 427 pages long and has 31 chapters, basically 31 exercises. And all these exercises have been updated to 326, although nearly 90% of the book will work with the long-term release. There's just a couple tasks in the book that require 326 because of the feature was introduced at 326, but those are clearly noted in the book when you mm -hmm. encounter those. Um, there's about 500 new screenshots in the book. And for the nerds out there, and this goes with um, QGIS for hydrological applications and any of the books written with Locate Press, they're all written in RST and YAML. And then there are a series of tools that Gary Sherman has written, uh, command line tools for building the book as you, as you produce it uh, with a latex pipeline to a PDF. Um, so that's how we, how we write things, these things. And I always get asked how long it took. And this is a screenshot of the GitHub commits um, to the locate press repo for this edition. So, you know, I started in January, but really started working on it in February. So it took about five months for me to do most of the work on this book. So now we can kind of go through some of the what, what's in here. So each chapter has uh, starts with an introduction and a list of tasks. And something I added this second edition is learning goals. So just a set of clearly described learning goals that give you a little more information on what you'll be able to do once you run through this chapter. There are also tips. So sometimes something that you don't have to do for the exercise, but kind of an aside that there may be another tool that you could use to accomplish the same task, for example. Um, there are discussion questions. So this is, if it's gonna be used in a classroom environment, this is where the instructor can use these discussion questions to um, evoke a classroom discussion about the topic at hand. And then I, for most chapters have a challenge assignment. And the idea here is that from my own experience in teaching, students often are just following through the directions and get to the goal at the end. But here with a challenge assignment, they're given a second set of data and they have to kind of, figure out themselves how to repeat that workflow on the other set of data to achieve that same goal. So it allows them to really learn the workflow and let that sink in a little deeper. So in what's new, I created updated graphics for each um, graphical user interface. So for example, 
the select by expression window. These a lot of these GUIs are getting pretty complicated with a lot of features. So I tried to put these um, labels on all of them at, whenever you're introduced to those in the book so that you can really see how that GUI works. Here's the one for the model designer. In a lot of chapters, I was able this time to include fuller explanations. So this is the chapter on uh, using blending modes in QGIS. And so this, this kind of thing where I go through uh, all the different groups of blending modes and give a description of each one. Uh, there's places in the book where I was able to add that kind of content to it. And there are seven new chapters. There's also several chapters that I omitted and deleted. Uh, there were in the original Geo Academy, there were some review chapters. And so I removed those to make room for new features in QGIS. So this chapter is on raster data analysis, where you learn how to use a lot of the raster analysis tools, such as the raster calculator, to, in this case, identify potential vineyard sites in a study area. There is a new chapter on field data collection, where you learn how to use merge in maps to uh, basically build your data collection form using uh, field form widgets and use the app to go out and collect data. There's a new chapter on using the style manager. because so I think this is one of the things in QGIS that often gets overlooked. And it's a fantastic little um, GUI for managing styles in your projects. So uh, this also includes um, working with legend patch shapes. Um, so similar to the legend patch shape uh, material in the hydrology book as well. There's a chapter on automating print layouts. So before this chapter, you'll learn how to build just a, a, a standard print layout. But here you learn how to automate it using print templates uh, and atlases to make your work easier. Uh, there's a new chapter. There was a chapter on labels, but it's been enhanced now with the uh, the annotation toolbar. So the annotations were just introduced this summer or this spring. And so it's an interesting uh, new aspect um, of QGIS. And so I wanted to be able to explain the difference between labels and annotation and workflows and use cases for each. And then finally, a new chapter on animating data with the temporal controller. So previously, there was a chapter using um, Anita Grazer's plugin, the time manager plugin, and that's now been replaced with a temporal controller. So there's a, a new chapter on how to work with that because it's a slightly different workflow. And then finally working with point cloud data, since that was just um, a very new feature in the last year with QGIS. And then there are also chapters that existed in, in the previous edition, but I've added new tasks. So for example, in the network analysis chapter, there's a task on computing network isochrones using the QNEAT3 plugin, which is really fantastic. There's a task on in the geocoding address data chapter on geocoding using the nominatum geocoding service, which has been incorporated into QGIS core. There's a task on using layer notes in the metadata chapter, which is a way, again, to uh, I think an overlooked feature now that where you can add notes about individual layers in the layer panel to keep track of things. Applying layer effects at the class level for the layer effects chapter. And then using the elevation profile feature that was just introduced with 326 for both point clouds and elevation data. Um, it's included in two different chapters, this new feature. So a lot of new material in this new edition. And there's also appendices in, in this book. So there had been a coordinate reference system chapter that I didn't really feel was well written. So I, and it was, it's such a complicated topic. What I basically did was remove that. And I just included in the appendix, a section on all the different coordinate system tools that you have in QGIS and why they're important, how to use them and what some of the things such as the, the, the warnings you get with certain um, datums come up now so that people understand 
and can have a reference place for those um, warnings when they come up. Anything to do with coordinate reference systems in the GUI is in here. There's a section on keyboard shortcuts, an appendix on popular plugins. And with these, I've highlighted these. If, they, if they're used in the book somewhere, I will have it that in bold. This was used in challenge exercise in part five, exercise eight, for example. So as you browse through these um, plugins, you can see uh, where in the book they were used. And then getting involved. I always like to have a piece at the end just about the QGIS project in general and how people can give back about QGIS Open Day and, and, and um, everything else that we have um, as a community. And then lastly, there's an expanded index. So the index now is about six pages long. So uh, it's much easier to find things in the book. So that is that, and I can take any questions about this book if there are any. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kurt. Um, if anyone wants the links to both the books and shameless plug my own blog, um, I put them into the live chat now. And if you have any questions, please um, have at it. Um, anyone in Hans's class or on the live chat. Um, brilliant. Oh, wow. Okay. Questions already. So I see Faisal is quick off the mark. Um, question one, what are the application problems addressed in the book? Oh, well, there's a lot. I mean, there's 31 exercises um, that start off with the basics of, of data models all the way through advanced data visualization and spatial analysis. So there's a lot of different topic areas covered. Um, there isn't one set of data that's used throughout the book. Every chapter kind of comes with its own set of data for that. So there's a myriad of topic areas covered. Awesome. Um, Kurt, I'm going to ask you to stop sharing your screen so that for the um, live stream, people can see who's speaking and who's in the room, et cetera. So um, we can always put up uh, the, the questions at the end. I see another question's come in from Lene. Um, any locate quote for this session buying the books? Um, no, we didn't plan <laughs> a, a quote for this specific session for buying the books. I think she means like um, a coupon code. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, um, I guess we just didn't think to get that set up with Locate Press, unfortunately. So. <laughs> I see Tim, your hand was up. Yeah, I just, um, uh, I've been having quite some fun going through the book. Uh, <laughs> I foolishly called it a speed run through the book, but it actually has been more like a snail pace run because I'm quite slow going through it. Um, but it's been quite, uh, and I'm talking now about um, the hydrological applications book. Uh, and I just wanted to comment on how well written it is and how nice it is to follow the book. Um, I, I wonder if you have advice for people like myself who tend to go off script and then run into all sorts of problems. Um, hence, um, for example, I ran into a problem with the, trying to use a coordinate reference system that wasn't supported and so on. Um, and I used, I think, substantially bigger data sets. So some of the, for example, showing the flow direction mesh took a really long time to open and um, so just maybe just some general comments on, you know, obviously we want to go through your um, curriculum, but we want to apply it to our own data in the end and some good strategies for, for how to not run into problems doing that would be great to hear from you. I watched your uh, sessions or some of them, uh, Tim. Uh, I, I could see how, how you were doing it and I could need not advise uh, my students to do it like that. <laughs> But uh, it's quite, uh, quite courageous uh, because you read the introduction page with the task and you start solving the task by yourself. <laughs> I think that is uh, that's something that like Kurt does at the end. I think it's didactically good after you have run through the, uh, the school formatted data sets and all the tiny steps that you write. So I think to, to make most out of it is uh, follow the procedure with the data and let it make sense and then mm -hmm. try it really try it on your own case and see how far you can go with that. 
Yeah, I also wouldn't recommend my approach to others <laughs> uh, trying to, um, uh, you know, trying to jump past key steps, which are often, you know, important in understanding what you're doing. It's not the best way to do it. Do you have any comments about the performance of um, PC raster? And uh, I don't know whether it's on the, like, for example, the flow direction mesh with the little arrows. Some of the things render quite slowly. Are there any, um, any things that you've encountered or any tips um, if you're working with your own data? Yeah, it's, um, so there are different uh, modules uh, used eh? so the mesh styling comes from uh, uh, from GS core and uh, so the, the the speed is not really determined by uh, by the PC raster tools but mm -hmm. more with how, uh, how the mesh functionality uh, reads uh, the, the grip data that is produced there so we use the crayfish plugin to turn uh, a PC raster map into a mesh and then we can use the built-in style mesh styling features to add those arrows and that's a lot of tweaking uh, of getting those arrows the right size depends on zoom level uh, but yeah that's just trial and error to get it right but the larger your data set exponentially your um, speed uh, gets uh, lower in, uh, in doing that and that's also with the uh, creating the flow direction map itself in pc raster with ldg create um, that is also uh, using five parameters, so we have much more control on uh, filling uh, the DEM, but uh, these are generally uh, also in Saga and Grass slow uh, algorithms because it has to do it iteratively and solve a lot of equations. So my advice, and that's also something written in the book and mentioned in the videos, cut your area really to the necessary size for the calculations. Don't make it any smaller because you will have a square catchment in the end because it hits the, the, the size, but also don't use all the SRTM tiles or whatever DEM you use process because there will be a lot of computational overhead uh, so i think that's the most important advice i can give and then for the styling of the mesh uh, or the conversion to grip it uses mdal and mdal does not support all coordinate systems then you also run into that problem yeah so i would say cut out a little piece of your d of your flow direction map and, and convert that to grip and use a utm projection or something else that is supported by uh, mdal yeah, thank you. But, uh, you know, uh, as I said, I, I've been going off script, but I'm still finding the book immensely entertaining and uh, learning a lot. So, so. It's also nice to see you doing that. I also learned a lot of how power users would use the book. <laughs> well, and of course, going off script is how you really start to learn things. So, yeah. <laughs> All righty. Um, there is a quick live chat comment um, from Faisal. Um, how do these books um, compare to, for example, the QGIS training manual or the QGIS website? Um, I'm assuming he's asking what makes the books better than just going to the training manual. Um, perhaps a quote to you and then to Hans? Well, yeah, I think um, ni neither book pretends or intends to be a, a, a QGIS manual. Um, I uh, think, you know, Discover QGIS 3X, for example, um, is teaching a lot of common workflows. And it's also an attempt by me to um, also include, um, uh, like, when, when there's an important QGIS feature, like supportive point clouds, then, of course, I will try to include that in, in, the, in the next edition of the book here. Um, but it is not trying to just go crazy with all the new QGIS features. It's really trying to be a practical book that helps people learn common workflows um, from from all, you know, and there's so many different workflows in GIS um, that it, it's almost endless, but the common ones, you know, working with networking, working with um, overlay analysis, working with um, producing a nice map. So all those common workflows are, are what I've really tried to focus on. And I would leave, give it up to Hans, but I think that, that the Hydro book is also, um, a set of specific workflows. And in that, you learn a lot about QGIS, but it is not trying to be a QGIS manual. There's way too many features in QGIS. 
there are many features into this, and also many ways you can connect them to do your own uh, workflow. So I see our books more as uh, problem-based learning and what we use in didactics. So you need to solve the problem. And while manual uh, or documentation is used to explain uh, what, the, what a certain uh, tool or button doesn't actually do, so it doesn't. It adds to each other. We make in our books references to the, the official documentation, and that's also very important so people can learn more about uh, the specific settings of the tool and go beyond uh, the problem that's very important. Yeah, I think I think that's an important point um, that both Kurt and Hans are making. Is these are not really a re they're not a replacement for documentation, etc., but they're specific workflows that are going to help you with an example i know i learn best if i have an example to work with um you know i can be going and finding and doing stuff with my own data all the time but it's so nice to have something that's curated that you are able to get the data work through the examples in a step-by-step -step, logical curated manner and i mean if you just look at the book they printed so beautifully like you have these amazing color images there are literally screenshots on every page. You have these beautiful screenshots taking you through. I know in Hans's book, um, you have these really nice, as you mentioned, flow diagrams at the beginning of each chapter, just taking you through. That's the one I can see now. Just taking you through the logic of how things happen. So um, in that way, if you are a GIS user slash technician, you can use the same logic with whatever um, program you use. So I think it's really important to note that these are more, for me, more practical learning materials than a documentation for a specific pro program or software. So that's what's really great about them. They're, they're, a, they're a practical basis for your knowledge. They're ways to practice. They're ways to get to know the program better. At least that's my take on it um, after reading the books. And, and, you know, going back to the Geo Academy roots of Discover QGIS, the original Geo Academy was written in, in Esri software. And so I was presented with the challenge of replicating all that in QGIS and PostGIS, and, um, which we did quite easily. We were happy to find. Um, but the, the first couple exercises, especially in Discover QGIS, are really GI. Uh, we lost, uh, did we lose Amy from the stream or? I think we lost both. Oh uh, yeah, okay. So let me see if the stream is still running okay here. Yeah. Yeah, I can feel that the stream is still running. Okay, I guess, um, I don't know what happened to Kurt, but I guess Amy probably had some power outage or something. It's typical in South Africa. Uh, maybe we just give them a minute to try and make their way back into... I can see, uh, there we go. Is yeah, we disconnected for a second. I'm, I'm not sure why we disconnected, but um, I'm back and the stream is back. <laughs> yep, how are you? There we go, okay. Live streaming is on. Yes, all righty. Uh, unusual, strange outage there. But um, we're all back in the world of the living. I do apologize. I'm not sure why Jitsi kicks us out. Um, thank you, Tim, for letting us know that there was an issue. Um, yeah, Kurt, um, please back to you. Just sort of rewind two steps and um, tell us your message. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was trying to answer the question again or, or expound on that question about um, the difference between the, the manual and the books. And I was just um, thinking about the fact that Q, Discover QGIS is based on that Geo Academy, which is really a, an open GIS curriculum. And one thing I was going to say was that it was originally developed in ArcGIS, 
And my challenge was to build that in QGIS with open source software, which we did. And um, so the, the first couple of parts of Discover QGIS are really GIS theory being taught with QGIS more, more than learning QGIS itself. So um, just using QGIS as a way to teach GIS. Brilliant stuff. And then um, I thought we do not have any more live um, chat comments. Thank you to everyone who has um, chatted in the live chat, and I do encourage you to ask any more questions. I wanted to hand over to Hans um, if anyone else in the room has any more comments or questions. Jeff, any questions from you guys? Silence. <laughs> <laughs> See, they're really good or really bad. We did a great job of explaining, or no one understands what the heck we're harping on about. <laughs> so, so, I have a, I have a question for Hans, um, uh, and it's maybe just a more basic question of um, uh, why do we still need to delineate catchments? I mean, surely somebody has already done all of the catchment and delineations of the world, and do they? I mean, do they change much, or like once once it's been done once, isn't it a solved problem? The problem is that it's a fractal kind of uh, uh, unit. So it has, there's this great uh, website, hydroshed.org, where they uh, have delineated uh, uh, catchments uh, at different levels. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine that, that maybe, uh, Tim, I don't know how hilly it is in your area, but you might have little gullies that even have their own catchment. So it's a scale concept. Yeah. And definitely those are not all uh, mapped. And I think that's also an endless job to, uh, to determine. So that's it's an one, issue of scale. Yeah. And there's another there's another important issue because in the book, the workflow uh, is about delineating the catchment that belongs to a certain outlet. That outlet can also be uh, somewhere in the river where you have a measurement device. So you want to know which area is contributing to that uh, discharge mm. measuring device or where you have some uh, pollutant uh, entry or whatever. Um, so then you need a specific point and you still need to use these kind of procedures. And I work a lot with, uh, with, with people who really need it at a tiny scale with very high resolution DMs. For example, how much storm water goes into the sewage system and then find out which area contributes to that specific well in the, in the sewage system of the city. So it's a scalable problem. Okay. So um, it's a good application area for taking like something like ODM and going and flying your own DIM of your small area and um, applying it like in a much more um large scale area so we we need, need to see a catchment map of your small allotment in portugal yeah <laughs> this one coming up i'm sure you have a drone tin i do I, I i do have a drone but um uh i have uh, uh, the cheapest one which doesn't have the flight control software which lets me get a perfect dim so far so i have made a dem actually already but it's um i need to make a better one before i start modeling with it but i've been modeling in my area in the larger area with uh, just the srtm data and that was going to be my other question is like um is that a good uh generic data set to use for uh like let's say medium scale catchment delineation or are there um issues so. with doing that yeah, I think so. It's a, it's a, a nice uh, resource, and we did some comparisons with other resources. Uh, some people used the Aster GDEM, which is derived from uh, stereo photogrammetry from uh, satellite uh, uh, images that are taken at uh, uh, an angle. So there's one Nadir watching the camera and one under an angle, and it creates a stereo image, and it processes all these images to create a DM of the world. But that creates a lot of artifacts. Mm. And for hydrologists, um, it's not really about getting the most accurate elevation at uh, the surface, including all the buildings and uh, the trees and objects that are there. But for catchment hydrology, you want a general surface. And that's also the, the difference between uh, a DSM and a DTM. So people mm -hmm. looking at very detailed areas want all the objects on it. Maybe if you study um, uh, a stretch of a river or some urban uh, processes, you need a digital surface model. model. Uh, but for uh, catchment uh, analysis, catchment hydrology, uh, DTM is desired because those little obstacles will, will just be in the way of the general routing of the water. 
Mm -hmm. um, you are uh, filling of sinks that you apply to the VMs, uh, take care that those obstacles are uh, removed and water is routed to, uh, to the lowest uh, areas, to the outlets. So I think that that's important. And I see a lot of people using these tools on 50 centimeter DSMs, in fact, derived from LIDAR. That's uh, not a smart idea for very large areas. And there's also the misconception that uh, the highest resolution is always the best. It needs to be fit for purpose. It gives you a lot of load on the calculation of your uh, mm. hardware. Um, also, it depends on the source. Eh? If you have these drone images and you interconnect them to very high resolution results, maybe your error per pixel is very high and you still run into trouble. Mm. These uh, algorithms are mostly designed for gravity flow of water, so it doesn't work. With our LiDAR data in the Netherlands, for polar areas, because we pump our water up to the river. So, also don't use it for that. Flat areas, they don't work. So, there are a lot of boundary conditions to make this all work. And SRTM is a fine data set um, that covers most of the world uh, that you can use for this for medium uh, catchments. Great. Brilliant. Um, we are running low on time, we have three minutes left. Um, so I will ask you to ask your last questions um, for now. If not, then I'll just ask for some final comments and we'll close the session. So any last questions? Just one comment. This one here mm -hmm. from Elisa. From, uh, yes, it's about the sources that are mentioned in the book uh, because for some people, please, has knowledge, has knowledge about hydrology terms and sources, it's still useful to know where you can download and get most uh, updated information. So for some it's traditional to have a physical information or information from maybe 10 years ago, but they are not aware that there's maybe some like image like you know, And that's something that happens. And to be um, also aware how data manipulates information and in the physical information. I think we covered that also quite a bit in the uh, Fibre Logic application, and quite short also in the first book. So the acquisition part, there is a whole chapter on it. But we, in the course, we, uh, we have this chapter five on uh, uh, open data where they use uh, quick OSM, super nice uh, plugin to get OpenStreetMap data, but also to link to web services. And during a course, we also have a mapathon that we work with, uh, uh, with the youth mappers we did uh, last week. And that was pretty cool because then we see it in action. They can contribute to OpenStreetMap and also then use that data in uh, GIS. So we try to expose uh, participants. And I think that's also a, uh, one of the pluses of the, the second edition that we use even more globally available data than in the previous edition where we sometimes had specific European data like uh, COVID. Mm. I think that is a problem, especially with a lot of um, new users, w is where to find data, where to find good data, um, even just to learn <laughs> with, um, not necessarily to apply to a project, but you know, um, learn, it's important to have good data to learn with or else you're not going to learn the correct skills because the data is iffy, for want of a better word. Um, <laughs> so that's actually fantastic and I think both books do a really great job of, um, of you know, pointing the user in the right direction of, as you were saying, up to date and um, great data. Um, I don't know, Kurt, if you have a last um, comment? Um, yeah, I just I, many many of the chapters include the the data source and, and ideas around that, and then discover QGIS. So, but it is a common problem, and um, you know, really just use the University of Google is is the <laughs> good place to start in your local area. Absolutely. All right, brilliant stuff. So it is two o'clock in my part of the world. Um, so it just leaves me to thank everybody um who joined us for this book review session i encourage you to go have a look at the books um and have a look at buying the books <laughs> of course um and go through the different um exercises 
I think, you know, both of these books are a great place to start and have a logical um, example of how to use stuff. I absolutely loved um, in the Discover book that you've incorporated the um, mobile applications that people can go out and collect their own data. I um, quite a long time ago wrote a blog on that and it's fantastic to see it being brought into the literature. So um, that is absolutely amazing. I love in the hydrological book that it's so it's it's so logical how to set up the layout of a map that you've now done all of this analysis and you've got stuff to show people, but you need to show it in a logical manner so that other people understand it. So that was absolutely one of my favorite chapters is just showing and making an effective layout that people can immediately get your message out of the map. So both of them have fantastic chapters, fantastic functionality in QGIS, and I encourage everybody to go and have a look, um, check out the books, and thank you to the authors for being here today. Thanks, Amy. Yep. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. All righty. Thanks, everyone. I have ended the stream. We are all good. We are